Welcome back everyone to the second of our American landscape lectures from the Great Depression. This one, the Mississippi Delta, hard times and blues music. Spotlight on geography uh, to begin here. We're talking in this lecture about the Delta region of the state of Mississippi and the river of Mississippi. You can see uh, on the outline of the US map uh, Mississippi's location uh, and you can see here how the river itself, the Mississippi River itself, forms a kind of natural uh, boundary of sorts between the states of Tennessee, Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, and Mississippi and how here on the western edge of the state of Mississippi is a leaf-shaped alluvial plain stretching north-south about 225 miles from uh, Memphis to Vicksburg, Vicksburg back to Memphis, uh, the region called the Mississippi Delta. It averages about 65 miles wide east to west. Now in geological terms, uh, this delta region is a lowlands region, uh, which typically through time would see uh, it being one of the floodplains uh, of the Mississippi River at it, as the river neared its mouth here in the Gulf of Mexico. The delta is famous in U.S. history as the land of cotton, Dixie. Uh, the place where uh, slave-owning, uh, property-owning, cotton-producing interests made great fortunes in the decades before the Civil War. Yet the Mississippi River itself has been an artery of life and civilization long before the arrival of cotton planters. Uh, native peoples use the river for transportation, connection, trade, commerce, and the exchange of culture. The Mississippi was a natural artery for such exchanges, uh, really from peoples across the broad middle section of the North American uh, continent, but also the Gulf of Mexico. And long before those cotton plantations, uh, the region was thickly forested with cypress trees and gum trees, oak and ash trees, mixed with tangled vines and swamps and dense cane brakes. Prior to the arrival of whites, it was home to the native mound building civilizations, including the Choctaw peoples. The Choctaw were among those forcibly removed by the U.S. federal government during the Indian removal period of the 1830s. And so these two geographies connect indirectly uh, the Mississippi Delta and the Indian Territory, later the Dust Bowl region of Oklahoma. The planting of cotton by Anglo-Americans in the early 1800s will transform the landscape of the Delta, uh, requiring that the landscape uh, be flattened out uh, that the hills be removed and the trees uh, be cut so that a flat land of cotton planting with its new civilization of land levelers replacing the ancient civilizations of mound builders. And it was here in the Delta that Mississippi cotton fed a growing global demand for manufactured textiles. An alien plant cotton brought from outside the Western Hemisphere, from West Africa uh, to the Mississippi Delta, along with the laboring peoples, themselves Africans, to begin the transformation of this new uh, cotton kingdom landscape. And by 1835, 
just about the time the native peoples themselves were being forcibly evacuated, uh, Mississippi comes to have a new majority of people, a black majority of enslaved men and women who would become the chief laboring force of this new cotton empire. A cotton empire that would push the American economy now into the modern age. By 1850, enslaved people outnumbered whites, free whites in the Delta by a margin of five to one. And the African American population would remain a majority, demographically speaking, a majority into the 1900s. Even after the abolition of slavery, uh, the rise of a share crop economy saw many uh, African American people, some of them former slaves, others the descendants of former slaves, continue to live on the Delta lands, uh, many of them picking cotton uh, into the 20th century. And former slave laboring plantations were now given over to share crop plantations and in many cases the old names remain the dockery plantation was a 10,000 acre plantation and sawmill supporting over 2,000 cotton farmers and their families in the early 1900s in this slice of American landscape a cultural revolution was raised along with the cotton crops what comes to be known as the Delta Blues, an indigenous song form handed down from the time of slavery uh, will become now one of the key cultural expressions of America in the 20th century. This musical tradition uh, that endured uh, through the slave times, in fact back uh, before the establishment of slave owning plantations in America back before the slave trade to the time of the West African musical cultures. Uh, a musical tradition will connect across oceans, across generations, uh, to foster a vital form of cultural expression in the American landscape. Wherever large numbers of African descended people gathered in the Americas, the cultural traditions of Africa mixed to create new cultural expressions. In the Mississippi Delta, a tradition of music developed out of slavery, inspired by traditions of African music sung first by slaves and later poor black laborers throughout the southern states evolving from spirituals and work songs come the blues a new form in the 20th century a new old form uh, that had been very uh, rooted in the experience of the African people in America the blues were copied taught and learned among friends shared among relatives and exchanged between travelers throughout the south the Delta Blues, a regional variant of this tradition, was known for its simplicity as well as for its emotional intensity. Most often a, a single instrument, a guitar, and a single player, singer, though sometimes perhaps accompanied by a harmonica player or perhaps a fiddle or less often a piano for the simple fact that these were sharecropping folks, uh, impoverished mostly, uh, musical experience, uh, musical uh, instruments were expensive. Uh, often they had to be improvised from materials at hand, uh, and thus uh, there was a kind of prohibition on the growth of, of large bands and and expensive equipment. The blues was characterized by this. Uh, simpler more intense expression where perhaps a single player would attempt to make up 
for the lack of accompaniment by making his sound louder or more distinctive. The Delta Blues guitar style was distinctive uh, and raw as well. The singer treated his guitar with a tough love, you might say, not so much strumming as plucking, bending, tearing at the strings, using a broken glass bottleneck as a slide or or maybe even a flat side of a knife to quiet the vibration of the strings. Now you'll have a chance to listen to some Delta Blues this week by following the links I provided in your module. You'll see the Delta Blues did not follow the rules of polite music. Sometimes a single chord with just a few modifications was used for an entire song. Rhythm in this context counted for more than traditional melody. The player might even slap at the box so the guitar could double as a percussion instrument. And the vocal style of the blues was defined by raw emotional intensity. Likewise, this uh, song of Skip James, Hard Time Killing For, James sung in a high falsetto in his song here uh, tells the story of hard times, uh, people drifting, as he says, from door to door. Uh, it's not uh, entirely evident that the hard times refer to uh, the G Great Depression years, uh, which were certainly felt across the country as hard times. Uh, they may have also referred more locally. Uh, to the hard times uh, of the people uh, suffering a setback uh, of one sort or another, or even of the singer himself uh, describing uh, a personal lament. Blues music reflected the Delta landscape and its people in myriad ways. Songs were uh, often symbolic and, and even uh, improvised. Uh, combining the material conditions of life uh, with the emotional conditions of life. A song like Robert Petway's Cotton Pickin' Blues might convey multiple meanings, uh, whether they be uh, economic and employment oriented or be uh, more personal, romantic, and love related. The Delta Blues could reflect the hard reality of life in the racial caste of the South. Parchman Farm, otherwise known as the Mississippi State Penitentiary, was established in 1901 on the very grounds of a former plantation and became the subject of several blues songs, including Booker White's Parchman Farm Blues. The convict labor system of the South was itself an extension of slavery uh, in which uh, black men could be arrested for any number of local code violations, uh, put in prison if unable to pay uh, court fees and fines, uh, handed over to the local penitentiary uh, as convict laborers uh, to serve their sentences and to work off the fines and unpaid levies owed. Uh, this was little more than uh, a variant, you might say, on the uh, system of slavery that existed before uh, the Civil War and uh, an experience that then found its way into uh, the songs of many blues singers. Prison songs reflected the harshness of convict labor, where, like in the days of slavery, uh, a single person, usually white, on a horseback, would patrol the, the rows of laborers, a uh, gun uh, on belt, uh, even a bullwhip uh, on the horse uh, saddle, uh, much like the overseer uh, had been in the days of slavery. Blues also painted uh, a picture beyond uh, the harsh confines of the penitentiary. Uh, 
uh, to the broader Delta landscape, uh, which at times could also inflict its own natural disasters on the people living in these lowlands. The Great Flood of 1927 saw rains uh, for months at a stretch pelting the central Mississippi River region. The strain uh, which the water put on the local levees uh, proved to be too great and as those man-made levees uh, gave way uh, to the river waters, the rising river waters, uh, the towns in the surrounding lowlands uh, found themselves inundated in a kind of biblical flood sense, uh, leaving whole populations scrambling to find high ground. 27,000 square miles of riverlands were flooded throughout a several state region, uh, touching ultimately seven states, in fact, and, uh, up to depths of some 30 feet. An estimated 246 people were killed in the flood of 27 and more than $400 million in damages. Blues singers like John Lee Hooker uh, memorialized the event and songs like the Tupelo Blues. 13,000 people were evacuated uh, near the town of Greenville, Mississippi. It was often uh, black laborers who were conscripted and forced to work on rebuilding the damaged levees. One Greenville resident, Morris Sisson, remembered they just herded them up and drove them to the levee, right down Nelson Street. That was the Negro drag at the time, and they just got them off the streets and just carried them right down to the levee, started them to work. They, being the local sheriffs and conscripted deputies uh, or labor gangs, labor impressment gangs, who could find uh, any available uh, black men to be conscripted, uh, not voluntarily, but by order of the sheriff, uh, conscripted into labor gangs to work on the uh, uh, the uh, levees, the, the delta levees, uh, many of them uh, in immediate danger of giving way. Uh, the first levee on the southern Mississippi to fail was the Mounds Levee Landy, just north of Greenville. It started as a small sand boil on the far side of the levee, but within minutes, a wall of water estimated at 11 stories high and three quarters of a mile wide came crashing down uh, across the flat delta lands. Uh, the water came up so fast it was said that people had to cut holes in their roofs uh, to get out of their houses alive. By the time of the flood, uh, record labels uh, were already uh, busy promoting uh, to a new culture of music lovers uh, 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 system of music that was advertised as blues. But this first blues was really uh, just an offshoot of jazz. And you can see here in this poster uh, from Mamie Smith, uh, the uh, instrumentation was very much in the style of New Orleans jazz with brass sections, uh, horn players, pianists, uh, and singers. But in the 1920s, music promoters looked to capitalize on a more raw edge style of blues, uh, the sort of blues that had been played in the places like the Mississippi Delta uh, called country blues. Advertising in the 20s uh, put this uh, style of uh, music forward as what it called race music, uh, marketed mostly to African American consumers living throughout uh, Mississippi, featuring black musicians and singers. A popular country blues artist from Texas, Blind Lemon Jefferson, became one of the first popular recording artists to play this style of down-home blues. In 1932, the Paramount Recording Company offered a greatest hits recording featuring uh, Blind Lemon Jefferson and other country blues players. This was strictly uh, a niche uh, market uh, 
understood by the recording companies uh, to interest mostly other rural, mostly black uh, record buyers. This was the age of the vinyl record album, and it would find its, uh, some of its first uh, and most uh, distinctive uh, sounds in the Mississippi Delta, where in modest nightclubs and juke joints, like the Club Ebony here in Indianola, Mississippi, uh, just across the, the railroad tracks, could find local blues singers performing on any given night of the week. Uh, guests might be treated to uh, some barbecue uh, and uh, liquor, uh, and the bluesmen uh, who would play had no real system of amplification, so the shouting of the blues over the tops of the crowd so that he could be heard outside and in the, the back ranks of the dancers uh, became the, the sort of stamp, the signature stamp of the Delta Blues players. In 1925, a local white store owner in Jackson, Mississippi by the name of H.C. Spire uh, began uh, approaching local black musicians uh, in the form of a talent scout as a means to promote uh, his music store business, which he had established in 1925 on North Ferris Street in Jackson, the back black business district of Jackson, Mississippi. He said he'd known for years that they ought to be recording Southern talent, especially black blues, uh, and the record companies at that time weren't. So Spire recorded demos upstairs on his own machine and set those demos to the larger record companies. And it was uh, by this means that the first uh, recordings of local Delta Blues artists were made outside Mississippi. Record labels taking an interest in Delta Blues recording. Recording companies uh, capitalizing on the new vinyl press technology like Vocalion, Bluebird, and Brunswick uh, began paying bluesmen from the Delta for recording sessions and would subsequently press those recordings into 78-speed uh, vinyl records that would be well-suited for playing on the popular Victrola record players of the age. Typically, uh, the artists were paid a lump sum uh, for a single recording session, six songs, eight songs, a dozen songs, whatever would be arranged, uh, paid a lump sum, a few hundred dollars, which was a lot of money compared to the uh, wages paid for sharecrop farmers. Uh, and so those who could capitalize, who had the talent, uh, often did so. Of course, they gave up any claims to future royalties that the records might uh, bring in. The first of the Delta uh, performers to become, in a sense, uh, a recording star was Charlie Patton. As a boy, Patton lived on Dockery's plantation, where he first learned to play guitar. And as a performer in the Delta clubs and juke joints, he gained notoriety for his showmanship, often playing with a guitar while down on his knees or held behind his head or behind his back. Charlie Patton was only five foot five inches tall and about 135 pounds. But everyone who heard him said his gravelly voice was loud enough to carry well outside the confines of the juke joint. In 1929, Charlie Patton recorded 14 songs for the Paramount record label after having been recommended by H.C. Spire. His first release, Pony Blues, sold well. Patton died of heart failure in 1934 at the age of 42, but his recorded uh, record albums lived on. Women's voices were also to be heard in the blues. Geechee Wiley, who resided in Natchez, Mississippi, performed in traveling medicine shows in the South and recorded six songs in 1930 before disappearing from the public record. One of her recordings that has survived to the present time, Skinny Leg Blues. 
These songs, as I said earlier, were often marketed as race music, intended to be purchased by black consumers uh, who wished to hear uh, the black recording artists. This was not too unusual uh, as regional song cultures often uh, were marketed or addressed to uh, local audiences of listeners. But with the advent of radio broadcasting and the growing popularity of vinyl albums, we'll see how these regional forms of music will gain larger audiences. Blues, jazz, gospel, and comedy records of the 20s and 30s targeting African Americans, but also eventually reaching wide audiences. In fact, uh, would become so popular in terms of the blues music that it would be renamed instead of race music by the 1940s it was being called rhythm and blues and that was largely a marketing uh, ploy to make the music uh, somehow more palatable to white consumers living outside the confines of the Jim Crow South. From the Delta uh, up the Mississippi River to Memphis and ultimately the birth of rock and roll with this music now expand uh, its base. I said if I ever got to the place where I could feel all that old Arthur felt I'd be a music man like nobody ever saw. That was Elvis Presley uh, born in the Mississippi Delta town uh, of Tupelo grew up hearing the music of the Delta Blues, grew up hearing recording artists, Mississippi born recording artists like Arthur Crudup, Big Boy Crudup, who recorded a song in 1946 called That's All Right. When Elvis Presley made his way to Sam Phillips Sun Records Studios in 1954, the song he first recorded was Arthur Crudup's that's all right. Sam Phillips was a white record producer who had been recording black uh, artists from the Delta for about a decade by the time Elvis Presley wandered into the Sun Studios. Phillips knew that he could, if he could find a white performer to sing the blues music, he could be marketed across the country to white audiences as a crossover star. Phillips' idea proved quite successful uh, and by the late 50s and early 60s the success of rock and roll music had inspired a broader interest in the roots music of the South. And although by World War II over 40 artists from the state of Mississippi, black Blues singers had made records with major labels. Most of them did not continue recording through the war years and were quickly forgotten. By 1960, a few collectors uh, had begun looking for those old 78 recordings. One of them was a white Southern named Gail Dean Wardlow, uh, a native of Mississippi who began collecting uh, old blues 78s and would uh, later on come to write a book about Charlie Patton. Wardlow recalled that while I was in college I started to work for an exterminating company in Jackson, Mississippi. During my lunch hour would knock on doors in the black neighborhoods and buy old Victrola records. I developed a pretty good selection of blues and I started listening to the records and really liked the music. That's when I got seriously into collecting the blues. This was all part of a blues revival by the early 1960s uh, and some of the uh, original uh, performers from the Delta uh, were located uh, by blues uh, collectors like Gail Dean Warlow uh, and brought back to new popular white audiences uh, in the North. Here you see Skip James performing at the Newport Folk Festival in Newport, Rhode Island in 1964. James was first recorded 
back in Jackson by H.C. Spire in 1931. It had not performed live since the 1930s. He, along with a number of original Delta bluesmen, uh, was rediscovered in the early 60s and became a major influence on American British rock and roll uh, from that point to the present. The so-called British invasion of the 1960s was fueled by British bands who had learned to play by listening to American blues music on radio in England in the 1950s. One of those bands of the British invasion, the Rolling Stones, made no bones about the fact that their greatest influence and their greatest interest in music stemmed from the music of the Mississippi Delta. That was all we listened to at the time, said Keith Richards, the guitarist for the Rolling Stones. Just American blues or rhythm and blues or country blues. Every waking hour of every day was just sitting in front of these speakers trying to figure out how these blues were made. So the music of the Mississippi Delta, which took root in the cotton lands of the former slave plantations, which stretched its roots clear back to the musical traditions of West Africa, became in the 20th century not only one of America's most vital and original cultural expressions, but eventually went far beyond the boundaries of the Delta, beyond the boundaries of America, to capture audiences internationally uh, as one of the most influential of America's cultural exports. And much like the Dust Bowl region of the Southwest, then the Mississippi Delta uh, in the 1930s would become uh, one of the most vital of American cultural landscapes 